Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is your old pal Righty here. Uh, we've been teasing that we had some kind of special guest appearing on our channel this week. And to my knowledge, I don't think anybody's guessed it right. I don't think the man requires any introduction. He's literally, you know, we admire professionalism on this channel. And when somebody is literally the greatest thing or the greatest ever at what they did, that's something to be very proud of. And we're happy to feature him on this channel. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, our special guest, the great Vince Russo, the man who created the Attitude Era, Mr. Russo. Righty, I added that in for you. Is that okay, Righty? Is that okay? That's fine, yes. Listen, you, you, you can play all the sound clips you want. Hey, now, Righty, a couple things off the bat. Uh, you talked yes, about professionalism. Uh, I'm looking in your eyes. You doing anything before you... Everybody thinks that. I am a teetotal, I promise. Okay, all right. So, no, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Now, I got to ask you, Righty, you are a man after my own heart because I saw that uh sweatshirt bro i love retro psychedelic janice that era bro how old are you i am 26 now how is a 26 year old a birds fan bro? <laughs> uh well uh, introduced by my parents and then the birds are a good branching off point to everybody else from that era because there's very few degrees of separation between the birds and like everyone else from that time so i from the birds, I learned about everybody else from that time. Yeah, Echo Canyon, bro. Did you see that documentary on? I the, did. Yes. That's uh, um, bro. I I so wish I lived during that year. I mean, I was born in '61, so I was young. But man, what a uh, what a great era of music, bro. I am very very impressed with that sweatshirt, bro. No, oh, cool. I appreciate. It. I mean, I wear it in like every video, so I think our fans are tired of seeing it. But it's <laughs> nice to have somebody who puts it over. No, it's awesome, bro. It, they probably think it's the movie or something. They have no idea who the birds are. Maybe I've, I've tried to educate the people, <laughs> but I think so, that... some of the, some of them have taken to it. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, fun talking about music. I hate to bore you with wrestling talk, but I have to ask you a few obligatory wrestling Absolutely, related questions. Bro, it's so, all you. It's all you, Righty. Go ahead. Right. And again, I really appreciate you making the appearance. It's super cool. Uh, so you've described your. A lot of people describe you as a booker, and you've stated many times you were not a booker. You were a writer. Can you explain to our audience what the difference is? It's really, really simple, bro. A booker is usually a former wrestler who basically starts the angle with two wrestlers that are going to have a great match. So they'll start the angle with the wrestlers because they know the wrestlers are going to have a great match. And again, bro, nothing against them. That's their background. They're yeah. usually former wrestlers. And then, bro, they will try to make sense out of some kind of a story. When you're writing television, bro, you have a writer. And that writer is looking at the different characters. And that writer is looking at, man, what two characters could have a great storyline? So you start with the characters, you get them in a storyline, and bro, then the match will just organically happen. So there, there's a huge difference between booking and writing. Now, this is something that has been boggling my mind for years. We started this channel in 2013, but wrestling has been going downhill long before that, as you know. Obviously, when you were the head writer and you were writing as opposed to booking and everything was character and storyline based, they were attracting the casual audience. And now it's like not only are they not attracting the casual audience, it seems like they're purposely trying to attract as little people as possible. I, I know you probably don't know the answer, but what is your theory as to why they would purposely be going after less viewers? I will never understand that. Wow, bro. I I don't know because I don't understand the logic, bro. Like take, take for instance, righty. This is what I always related to, you know, let, let's take AEW for uh, example. They have a very small, limited audience. They have a very niche audience. And for some reason, the mentality is this is ours. Nope. Nobody else can come near it. If you don't like it, F you, bro. Like it's, it's, it's theirs. It, it can't go any further. 
So let's take, for instance, you, righty. You got that sweatshirt, the the birds. Okay, bro, say, you know, you're a young kid. A lot of your friends don't know the birds. So what do you do, bro? You want to introduce them to a band and music you love. Guys, you got to listen to the birds. The bird. You're sharing it with everybody. That's when you like something, bro, you, you want them to be popular. You want them to be successful. You're going to tell your friends about them, whether it's a movie or a TV show or a band. This is the complete reverse psychology, righty? I wish I could tell you the logic behind it, because if they were true fans, they would want as many people to be watching this as possible. It would not be an exclusive club. So I can't, bro, I can't explain it to you because it goes against everything I know. Yeah, it, it's completely devoid of logic. But I've heard you say on some castrating the marks that maybe a theory, the audience and even some of the people in the business are people who have just been bullied over their love of wrestling, they're nerds, they're borderline sexual deviants. Could it be that they were bullied by people who may represent the casual audience and they don't want them to now enjoy the thing that they cling to? That's a good theory, righty, but think about that for a second. If 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 it's if the, if that's true with what you're saying, I would think if I was somebody that was bullied Okay, just take a Tony Khan, for instance. And I'm not saying Tony Khan was bullied. I, I, I think he might have been. I'm going to be honest with you, but I don't know that for a fact. But if I'm Tony Khan and I was bullied, and all of a sudden I have something that I think is really cool, I would want to let those bullies know that because I would say, hey, look, man, I I'm cool, too. Now, you guys, <laughs> hey, look, I, I know I wasn't cool. in you know, the third grade when you guys had me sitting alone at the cafeteria table, but I'm cool now. So so again, bro, bro, we're, we're living in a world righty where just logic defies everything and and when you're a very logical guy i consider myself a very logical guy when you're a very logical guy and everything starts with logic bro when you take logic out of the equation nothing makes sense man yeah i hear you i just don't know how it got to that point but but if it defies logic, then there's no sense trying to logically dissect exactly. it. Exactly. You can't. You can't do yeah. it, bro, because it's just, it's just not logical. Right. All right. So a lot of people these days, especially in the YouTube wrestling community, use the word over a lot to describe wrestlers they like. Now, you obviously, as the guy who wrote the Attitude Era, you know what over is. So if you could give us what your definition or your qualifications as to what makes a wrestler over is, how you get a wrestler over, and why can't they get a wrestler over today? I'll tell you exactly what over is. Over is, bro, when you walk through an airport and every head turns because people know you're somebody. They, they, they may know you're a wrestler, but if they don't know you're a wrestler, they know you're somebody. So you're going to walk through an airport, bro. It's called the airport test. You're going to walk through an airport and every head is going to turn. That's somebody. I, I saw that guy on this and that. That's somebody. Bro, come on. Look, look at that AEW <laughs> roster. Like, with all due respect. Um, what was the second part of that question? As the head writer of the Attitude Era, when basically everyone was over, how do you, how do you get somebody over? Here's the problem, righty. Here's the problem. It starts with the it factor. Yeah. They got to have the it factor. They got to have the it factor because, bro, I'm going to tell you, if they don't have the it factor, they're never going to get over. And, and when you work with these wrestlers, bro, you know very early on whether or not they have the it factor. And I say this all the time, bro. This is where I give huge kudos to JR. When I was handed a JR roster, everybody deserved to be on that roster. Mm -hmm. Every single person. It was now my job to help get them to the next level. Bro, I can remember when I was at TNA 
and all these people were getting signed, I can remember telling Dixie, Dixie, they're never going to get over. They don't have it. Bro, being a great wrestler or a great indie wrestler or having a great move set, bro, that's not it. You got to have the it. And, bro, I am old school. Television stars should be on television shows. I don't want to see normal people on TV shows. I don't want to see my next door neighbor. I put on TV because I want to see TV stars. And I used to have this argument with Dixie all the time because that's when they started bringing in guys that could have great matches. And I would say, Dixie, they could have the gr- 100 great matches. If they don't have the it factor, they're not going to get over on just having great matches. Right. Yeah, the great matches thing, I'll, I'll never understand that one. It's just it's an excuse to not have to actually write storylines. That's all it is. Absolutely, bro. You're right, man. You're right. And now, do you think a great writer can get people without the it factor over easier than a guy with the it factor can put over bad writing. Say that one more time. I got to digest that. If there's a good writer, can he get a guy who doesn't have the it factor over easier than a wrestler with the it factor can get over with bad writing? Yes, because I'll tell you why. Here's the problem. If you're a wrestler with the it factor and you're given bad writing, Okay, the problem is, bro, in your heart of hearts, you don't believe in that writing. So you're going to go out, bro. You're going to try to be a pro. You're going to try to make what we always used to call chicken salad out of chicken shit. But in your heart of hearts, you don't believe what you're saying. You're never going to get it over, bro. And human nature is. I'm, I'm not going to believe this. And no matter how hard I try to sell this, I, I've i got to believe it to get it over. Right. So would you say, I know you're a big Bray Wyatt fan. You you, you said many times that you, if there's one guy you wish you could write for today, it would be him. Is there anybody else that you think could have been a big star back in the day? Oh, man, there's, yeah, bro, there's, I mean, there's so many people, bro, like, I, I mean, I can look at the roster today, like, oh, like, I don't know who Elias pissed off, I, I have no idea, Elias would have been huge uh, under my thumb, bro, I think Baron Corbin would, I would have never put Baron Corbin in a, you know, a King Vitamin crown with a sep- <laughs> you don't do things, this is a legitimate, you look at this guy, bro, You know he's a legitimate badass. You know he's a former athlete. You know the guy can hold his own and carry himself. You don't make him a cartoon freaking character, bro. Bro, I saw – bro, like just raw guys, like a guy like Buddy Murphy. Like, bro, one of the best matches I've seen in the last five years was when Buddy Murphy and Alistair Black beat the – ever loving piss out of each other okay and so like they were the real deal they did absolutely nothing with him bro another guy being totally wasted now i worked with um uh god what's his name now uh, uh um gunner what's gunner's name he, he plays a uh, lot of- jackson, jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Bro, this guy was a gunner. This mm-hmm. guy sat on a tank and gunned down people. What are you doing? So I I, I watched that show, and I, I swear, bro, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say, God, if I only worked with him, or God, if yeah. I only worked with her. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say I, I didn't say that every week. Bray Wyatt specifically, because oh, like he yeah. he had like he obviously cares about his performance and they've given him just nothing to do. Bro, if you can't get a guy like Bray Wyatt over, you you need to get out of the wrestling business. You 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 need to find another profession of work. Uh oh my god, bro. What what a travesty. What a it's, travesty. it's apparent to just a schlub like me just watching the show. Like when he first came up, like Everything is there, yep. but he's just had nothing to do on the show. It's not yeah. his fault. Like. And bro, that's the problem. See, here's the problem, righty. This is what, you know, everybody that wants to take their digs at me. Let's again, let, let's speak truth here. 
a lot of people, oh, yeah, Vince, yeah, you were a great writer and this, that, and the other thing because you were working with great talent like The Rock and Austin. Bro, that's the challenge. When you got guys like Rock and Austin and Mick Foley and, and Taker and Shawn Michaels, bro, when you got talent that good, as a writer, you've got to write to their level and beyond. Because, bro, if they're a great talent and you give them shit, you're going to bring them down. No, bro, you got to continue to get them over and over and over and over and over. That's what has happened to Bray. You've got writers there that can't write up to his level. They're not capable of it, bro. So what have they done? They've brought that character down. I was not going to do that to any character, bro. When you had the talent of the people that I worked with, I was not going to bring you down. I was going to make sure your TV was better and better and better every week, man. Yeah, and, and it was. And everybody from any position on the card, they were all over. They were all getting the intended reaction, too, which is something that's completely unheard of these days where heels are getting cheered and faces are getting booed. Never happened when you were writing the show. Absolutely. Bro, when we, when we wrote the show... Because we had the audience in the palm of my hand, bro, we knew exactly, cheer here, boo here. We knew exactly what the response of the audience was going to be as we were writing the show. Now, you were the head writer of WWE and Raw magazines before you were head writer of the show. Yes. And you said many times the, the famous scene where you go into Vince's office, you think you're going to be fired, and he throws down the copy of the magazine and says, this is what I need the show to be. Yep. I'm too young to really remember Raw Magazine. What was it about the magazine that he wanted oh, bro, reflected well, on the show? Bro, righty, when I first got hired for the WWF magazine, bro, they were making all the shit up. None of it was <laughs> real. And I was like, wait a minute. You've got access to all these guys and you're not interviewing them, nothing. You're just making all this shit up. So again, bro, they were 20 years behind the curve like they are now again. They're 20 years behind again. So basically, bro, the Raw magazine became a shoot magazine real interviews, people talking about real stuff. You know, when we interviewed Bret Hart and he was jumping to WCW, he was talking about Eric Bischoff. I mean, this was real shoot uh, stories, not make-believe, mamby, pamby stuff that was 20 years outdated. And how did you get away with doing that for so long at that time in the company? Like, that's probably not something that... Because, bro, the magazine was really under the radar. You know what I'm okay. saying? I mean, Vince was always all about TV. Mm -hmm. So, like, I was able to really get away with a lot of that stuff under the radar. Okay. Now, uh, certain wrestlers back when you were writing had more creative leeway than others, correct? I wouldn't say so. Oh, okay. I wouldn't say so. Because I was going to ask if Triple H had been one of those guys, was there any sign? Because his creative nowadays, he's just he's a match mark. He's just go out there, have a great match for 40 minutes. No story, no character, no nothing. Was there any indication back then that that was like his view on how the wrestling business should be? Well, bro, I, I had a real eye awaking experience with Triple H that um, I'll never forget. And it was it was really uh, eye opening to me. Um Bro, I don't, I don't, it's not that I'm taking credit for anything. I'm just giving you the facts because the facts are important. Bro, when Triple H was doing the blue blood gimmick, um, bro, I was writing every word that came out of Triple H's mouth. Then when they did the curtain call at Madison Square Garden and the entire company turned on Hunter, I was the one there saying, Hunter, they're testing you, bro. Stay strong. You'll get through this. I, I was really in Hunter's corner for all that, right? So, you know, bro, then, then we were making DX and, you know, I mean, we wrote great, great stuff for them. And then they were in an angle with the uh, nation. And I remember one night at Raw, bro, like Triple H refused to put D'Lo Brown over. And now, bro, first of all, if you know D'Lo, bro, he's the nicest guy in the world. I could understand, oh, I don't want to put the guy over. He's a prick. He's, no, D'Lo's the nicest guy in the world. And 
all of a sudden Triple H didn't want to put him over. And I and, and I remember turning to him and saying, bro, the guy put you over like 10 times. Like now it's time for you to put him over. But I remember, bro, because like from that moment on, I really looked at Triple H a little differently. Mm-hmm. It was almost like D'Lo was beneath him. And not not in my eyes, he wasn't. Mm-hmm. So kind of became like a mark for himself a little bit before he even became a big star. Yeah, that's that's the first time I really saw it, bro. Okay. Switching switching gears, as Michael Cole would say. We'll get to Michael Cole later. Uh if this is probably a question you've been asked a million times, but if if Austin and Rock were just not there and you were head writer, who do you think would have been like the guys? Who would you have pushed as the guys? Oh man, bro. Um man, I'll be honest with you, bro. I would have I would have done everything in my power to probably keep Sean on top. You know, you gotta understand at that time, bro, Sean was battling demons. He was not the easiest person in the world to work with, and he was creating a lot of problems. But if we did not have Austin and The Rock, I would have done everything in my power to keep him straight so he could, you know, he could, you know, be the headliner. Right. Now, you and Ed Ferrara, you were the two main guys. You wrote the entire structure of the show. You'd give it to Vince. He'd give his feedback. And then that would be what ended up on TV. Did you guys have, like, underlings who wrote, like, Mm -hmm. less important promos, right? Or was it just you two? Just us two, yeah. That is absolutely insane to me. (laughs) Now, bro, I will say this. I want to say this because I want to make sure everybody gets the proper credit. Uh, Somebody that wrote for me on the magazine and then later came to WCW with me, there was a a writer by the name of Bill Banks. Okay, Mm -hmm. now I I would, bro, without a shadow of a doubt, Bill's office was across the street from, across the uh, hall from mine. And, you know, while I'm formulating these ideas, like before I even get with Ed, I would call a guy like Bill in. And I would say, bro, I'm thinking about this, that, and the other thing. What do you think about this? And I would get ideas from Bill as well. As a matter of fact, bro, Bill has always said that it was his idea for, um, Uh, This is your life, Rock, that segment. And, bro, like, I swear to you, I don't remember. But if Bill says that, I believe him. So, in other words, bro, I would bounce ideas and stuff off of people like Bill. But then when it got to the writing of the show, it was the writing and the producing of the show. It was me and Ed, and that was it. Right. And you were still doing the magazines at the time. Yes. Yes. So you, that that's a lot of different hats to juggle there. Like, did, and I know you said you had to put your family on the back burner at the time. Like, yep. what what kind of life was that doing? Like, you because right now you pride yourself in being out of the wrestling bubble. Yeah, were you like fully all in with it at the time? Bro, there's the, when you're working for Vince that you have to be, bro. He he demands that. He demands. He owns your life. 24 seven and bro like that's fine i i i uh you know i bought into that but unfortunately this is where he's not smart about it while he's owning your life bro he's also burning you out mm-hmm. you see now if that's me and i'm the owner of the company and i'm depending on somebody as much as he was depending on me i am going to make sure that person has some break uh, breaks. That person has time to, you know, rest their batteries. That person, you know, I'm going to make sure because I want longevity from that person. But with Vince, bro, it was nonstop 24-7 for five straight years. And at the end of that, I was completely done. Right. There's... Kevin Dunn's name gets brought up a lot online because a lot of people don't know what he actually does on the show. They assume that he's a writer and he just gets shit on relentlessly by idiots online who don't know anything about him. You have always put him over as somebody who you really couldn't have done your job without. Can you explain what Kevin Dunn actually does for the show and how he helped you along? Kevin Dunn runs the entire television 
uh, uh, department of WWE. Kevin Kevin Dunn is TV. The W Kevin Dunn is just as valuable to the WWE as Vince McMahon. The WWE would not have been successful without Kevin Dunn. When I was there, Kevin Dunn ran TV. He had nothing to do with the writing of TV. Kevin Dunn didn't pitch ideas or suggest ideas. Vince and Ed wrote the show. Kevin Dunn directed and produced the show. It was two separate things. Now, I don't know if that's changed over the years, but I could say when we were there, Kevin never, ever, ever stuck his nose in creative. He ran a hell of a television division. He did his job, we did our job, and we worked together. Because you're like, and I trust you more than a lot of the other wrestling people out there because you're one of the only people who will say, I don't remember, or I'm not going to call this guy a liar. If he said it, it's probably true. I don't remember. So I trust you more than a lot of other people. Everybody just says Kevin Dunn's like an idiot. He does a terrible job. And I, I don't see how you can say that when you look at the production quality of WWE. I don't know how you could get off saying he doesn't do an amazing job. He does an amazing job, bro. He's been there for, if you talk about a guy who just absolutely dedicated his life to Vince McMahon and the WWE, bro, I don't have a foul word to say about Kevin. And I'll tell you this, bro. If it were up to Kevin Dunn, they would have hired me back as a writer 20 years ago. Kevin Dunn would be the first one to say, come on, bro, you you know what Russo did. You know, nobody's been able to do it since. Kevin Dunn would be the guy to say that. All right, cool. These days, because of the, well, not, I don't really want to say popularity, but the prevalence of indie wrestling within the WWE these days, they're signing so many of these guys who have these long indie resumes because they want to make the marks online happy. But everyone they're signing is like already in their mid thirties. By the time they make it to the main roster, they're already close to 40. Bro, is I, this said that, I said that years ago, right? Right. I, I remember when NXT first started and I was looking at some of these guys, I remember saying, bro, these guys are not spring chickens. And then I actually started looking up the ages and I was like, why are you signing guys in their mid-30s when you should be signing guys that are 22 years old that are going to have so – bro, I, I recognized that like literally 10 years ago. Yeah, and it's like – and it's not just that they're mid-30s. They're mid-30s and they've been wrestling the indie style for years, so they're doubly broken down. They spend so much time in developmental. By the time they make it up to the main roster, they're close to 40. Right. Like, is, this, is this a sustainable – like, I, I can't imagine that it is, right? No, I mean, bro, I, you know, again, I always I always compare wrestling a lot to professional sports. Mm. Bro, pro professional sports, bro, they go going after athletes when they're 16 years old. Baseball players are not getting signed at 35, bro. Yeah. Like, it's, it's I, it, I again, bro, it just defies logic. It just defies logic. They're going and then, for and then, bro, on top of that, those people are going to be set in their ways. Mm -hmm. They're going to have learned from so many people and they're doing things a certain way. Now you got to break them out of the way they're doing it and you got to teach them the WWE way. It just it doesn't make any sense to me mm -hmm. unless, unless it's an exception. But this happens. This happens all the time, bro. You experienced that in TNA, right? In your later years of TNA when they were bringing in all these guys and you yep. you you. you going on record and said that like the talents that from back in the day like nash and steiner and booker t you could work with them and they were receptive and then as the years went on as the new guys came in they were disrespectful they yep. were set in their ways and bro that's why like like i said bro uh you know as i was getting on in tna because i could see the business really really changing and bro the biggest change in the business for me was the lack of respect from the new people coming in, bro. That's when I really started understanding and realizing I didn't want to be a part of that anymore. I, I, I did not want to work with them. Um, that's not what I was used to. I was being disrespectful. I felt a lot of them was spoiled, rotten brats. And bro, to be quite honest with you, I did not want to work. If that's going to be the new talent coming up, 
I did not want to work with those people. Right. This is kind of an oddly specific question, and you probably don't remember because it's, it's kind of random, but I've, I've wondered this for a bit. After the Ministry of Darkness broke up, Undertaker was doing that tag team with the big show. And he would cut promos about motorcycles and he'd be seen backstage with like the bandana and stuff. He was kind of out of character. I don't know if you, you were still writing at the time, but was this hinting toward like, were you, if you were still writing, were you going in the biker direction that he ended up going? No, in after I, don't, you I, left? Don't, I don't think I was, I don't think I was writing because I was never going okay. in the biking direction with Taker. But I will tell you this, bro, if you remember, we had a magazine cover way before that of Taker on a motorcycle. And the reason why I did that was because I knew his love of motorcycles. Mm -hmm. So I thought it would be a, like a really, really cool cover. And I knew he would be into it. But when I was there, there was never any talk of a biker okay. thing. Yeah. yeah, I never liked the biker thing anyway. I always thought yeah. Taker was at his best when you were writing for the show. I've said that many times. Uh, when you came back briefly in 2002, you said you had that one meeting with the writers committee, you pitched a year of television, and then when you left, they all proceeded to bury you and, and that ended up not working out, unfortunately. Do you remember what your ideas were? Um, bro, my biggest idea, my biggest idea was, bro, I, as much as him and I did not get along personally, still do not get along personally. The idea I really pitched was Vince McMahon. I said to Vince, you have to hire Eric Bischoff. You've got to hire Eric. Eric is a great talent. So like the story I pitched was Vince winds up hiring Eric. And, you know, Eric is, you know, just up Vince's ass, putting him over, doing everything Vince wants, blah, blah, blah. And bro, like Shane McMahon, like smells a rat. And Shane McMahon is like, dad, this guy's full of shit. Like, can you not see it? And Vince gets hot at Shane because Vince claims Shane's being, are, are you jealous? Are you jealous of my relationship with Eric? You're my son. You're jealous. And Shane smells a rat. And then, bro, slowly but surely, Eric starts undermining Vince. And then we find out later on in the con in, in the story, he had some kind of clause written in his contract that, you know, Vince wasn't really aware of. And, you know, all of a sudden, Eric starts developing some power, starts... Uh, suggesting to Vince they sign this former WCW guy, that former WCW guy, and hence the Eric slash WCW takeover done the right way. Yeah. Okay. That, that's that that's was very cool. That was the main, main storyline that I laid out that everything else was going to, uh, you know, everything else was going to develop out of. Did you see any of the actual invasion stuff that they did? Not really, bro. I, cause, yeah, it was kind of a botch all around. Yeah, yeah, bro. That's a um, that's a big, complicated, intricate story. If you're not a writer, you're mm -hmm. not gonna do it right, bro. You, there's there's too many intricacies. Yeah, it was real. The way it ended up being, it was just kind of like guys are gonna run in, they're gonna have fake wrestling fights, and then the WWE wins the end. Like it was, it was no slow burn, no actual story being told. It's just, here's a bunch of guys. They're going to run in. They're going to fight. Yep. yep. Which I guess that's just what 99% of wrestling bookers come up with for things. Exactly, bro. That's what you see today, man. I got to ask you about Michael Cole. Cause on, on this channel, since we started, we can't stand his commentary. His personality just, it bothers everybody. You did commentary with him for uh, Shotgun New York, and you blew him out of the water, quite frankly. What was he like? Did you have to work with him at all? What kind of person well, is he? I'm not trying to get you to bury anybody. But. Well, no, 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 no. You got to remember, though, bro, when I was there, bro, Michael Cole was the new kid on the block. Mm -hmm. So Michael Cole was looking, you know, bro, you had JR and you had Lawler. Michael Cole was looking to get his foot in the door. So, bro, you know, 
from being the guy trying to get your foot in the door to the guy that's been there for 25 years now, you know, to it's, it's the same with Hunter. Like I, I tell people, listen, man, I really, for the most part, I really enjoyed the Hunter I worked with. I don't know about this Hunter today. I didn't work with the Hunter that married Stephanie and I didn't work with that guy. So it's the same with Michael Cole, bro. A very young Michael Cole was respectful, wanted to learn, really wanted to just get an opportunity. That's the guy that I worked with. I I don't know um, his demeanor today because he's just been there for so long now, you know? Right. I just never liked his commentary. And when you did commentary with him, I just thought, like, Michael Cole, shut up. Let let this guy talk. He's better. <laughs> uh, I know you never worked with him because he had passed away before you even got there. But there's very little out there about Vince's father. Uh, did you hear any stories about him, like what kind of guy he was or what people thought of him? Because there isn't too much info out there about him. I just know what, you know, what Vince thought of him. Like, you know, the story that I always tell, bro, is – Bro, I was never a suit and tie guy. I, 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 bro, you, you could, if you offered me a million dollar job and said, I got to work in a suit and tie, I swear I would not take it. I can't, I can't work that way. I have never been able to that way my whole life. So, bro, I remember when I first started working for the company, there was a house show at Madison Square Garden. And I remember dressing very nicely for the show, but not wearing a suit and tie. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, Vince pulled me to the side and more or less cut a promo on me because of what Madison Square Garden meant to his dad. And he, uh, his dad was in the Madison Square Garden Hall of Fame. And he was so proudful of that. And like that was the first glimpse that Vince really showed me into his dad. And then, bro, I can remember when Vince was put in a very difficult situation, he would always refer back to his dad. Like when, when, the, when the Sean Brett thing was going on, I remember Vince telling me specifically, you know, you know Vince, with situations like this, my father would always tell me, just get the match in the ring. Mm -hmm. And, bro, that's exactly what happened. It's the Survivor <laughs> Series. He got the match in the ring. And then, you know, we obviously saw the finish. But he, bro, he thought very, very, very highly of his dad. And, and, and any of the former wrestlers you spoke to, you know, bro, because remember, I was there when Arnie Skolin was alive and working there. Gorilla Monsoon was there, bro. Um, you know, Chief J. Strong, bro. I worked with all those guys. Jack Lanza, bro, I never, ever heard a negative story or one negative word spoken about Vince Sr. All right, cool. Yeah, just because there's, there's just not a whole lot out there about him. So that was yeah. cool to hear. Changing, still related to wrestling, but not quite. Uh, I want to talk about marks now, which is your area of expertise these days. You're the world's foremost authority Absolutely. on marks and their awfulness. So can you just, in, I know what your definition is, but for the people watching, define what a mark is. Bro, a mark is really, a, a, a mark is when you've crossed the line from fan to obsession. That's what a mark is. And a, a mark is literally, bro, I, I do castrating the marks every week. And when you hear from these guys every week, bro, you swear to God, they think it's real. Like somehow, some way they have convinced themselves that this is not a television show. People are actually winning and losing <laughs> and this shit is real. That's a mark, bro. When you've convinced yourself that this is real, when you have become absolutely obsessed with the industry, at that point to me, you are a, just a total, total mark. And for those of you listening and you think that Mr. Russo is exaggerating when he says these people think it's real, I'm I'm a, a brand member. I, I listen to Castrating the Marks every day when I'm working. He's not joking. Yep. 
these people are absolutely out of their fucking minds. Well, I, I always say that, bro. If you played castrating the marks for any non wrestling fan, any non wrestling fan, bro, they would turn around to you and say, do these guys think this shit is real? <laughs> I swear to God, my, my wife would say that. That's what my wife would say. Wait a minute. Did, did they not know this is fake? Mm-hmm. It's on you, bro. Can you explain to a, the, the viewers what castrating the marks is? Yeah, castrating the marks, bro, is where we take clips from all the shows of the Dirt Sheets, the Dirt Sheet writers and their podcast and their tweets online. And we just expose them literally for what marks they are. They have no knowledge of the business. They've never worked in the business. They've always been on the outside looking in. And I'm sorry, bro, unless you've been in the trenches, you don't know what the frig you're talking about. I'm sorry, man. I, I, I'm a huge baseball fan. I don't expect I, – I, I don't pass myself off as a baseball expert. No, bro. Those are the players that used to play the game. Those are the coaches. Those, those are the empires. Those are, you know, those are the scorekeepers. Those are the people that were involved in the game. I am a fan. But God forbid you tell them that they're just fans, bro, because they think they are a very, very intricate and important part of the business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you guys like Busted Smarks, Castrated the Marks is so much better than that because it's the audio. You, you can hear the markiness in their voices. It's yeah. Meltzer, it's Wade Keller, it's all the people that y'all hate. So if, I highly recommend, yeah, we'll get the plugs in afterwards, but I highly it's, recommend it's, you check out Castrated yeah, the Marks. It's this, it's, uh, it's Dave Meltzer and Tony Khan here. <laughs> Those are that's two marks talking about wrestling. Right there. That's all you need to know, bro. That's it. Do you have the clip at the ready of Meltzer talking about uh, Cork and Hall? Oh yeah, hold on, bro. <laughs> uh, here we go. Well, play everything's Cork and Hall. So if you stay in Cork and Hall, you're gonna walk. It's a twenty minute train ride. Yeah. Oh, come on, bro. Like, come on, like, <laughs> bro, come on. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. What's the best? What's the best thing you guys find on there? Uh, Meltzer doing the voice like that. Wade Keller booking. Uh, when Sharon Johnson's audio cuts out, like, what's the best? Uh, it's it's all so good, bro. We had a brand new clip yesterday, a brand new Bruce Mitchell clip. This was a brand new clip, bro. He was talking about WrestleMania for uh, like Hercules Hernandez and the Ultimate Warrior, bro. He was talking about their nipples. <laughs> I swear to God. And bro, he was talking about how the Warriors nipples had changed over the years. And I'm like, what the f- like, <laughs> like, what is wrong with you, dude? That's something I wanted to bring up because Bruce Mitchell is one of them, but a lot of the fans these days with the things that they say and the product that's actually made it into the ring at this point, this this whole industry is becoming just like a, a den of iniquity and a bunch of sexual deviants running around. Bro, Why is this happening? I don't know. Ev, they they work sexing and climaxing and jerking off and master. They work that into everything, bro. It's unfreaking believable, man. It's happening in the ring now, though. There was a segment on on Dynamite where. Uh, the Jackal and, and Kenny Omega were 69ing each other in the ring. The Young Bucks are always kissing dudes. There's all these clips online of Kenny Omega fingering people in Japan. Like, why is this happening? Why is this what the audience demands? I have no idea, bro. It's, 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 this needs to just be a wrestling show. Now it's it's borderline gay porn now. It's bizarre, bro. It is bizarre behavior. Why, in in your opinion, because I'll never understand it, why do the wrestlers these days care at all? What Dave Meltzer and Wade Keller have well, to say about them. Marks have made it to the ring. They're freaking marks, bro. They are marks. Bro, you're seeing a bunch of guys who had all these hopes and dreams of becoming professional wrestlers at 12 or 13, whatever they were. And all of a sudden, bro, they're on, you know, national TV prime time as professional 
wrestlers. And they're the same marks that they were at 12 and 13. Mm-hmm. So, bro, I worked with guys where it was all about money and it was all about business. And, okay, you want me to do this? Okay, how much are you paying me? Mm-hmm. They looked at it as a business. It, it the, the marks have made it to the ring, bro. There's no other way to explain it. At what point is it like the responsibility of some of the old school guys to say like, listen, Meltzer, Keller, all these guys, like it doesn't matter what they say. They're they're losers. Like we used to laugh at them back in the day. Like, bro, I don't know. I I I don't know, man. I don't know. I I think there's a lot of guys who are in a position to do that that just don't give a crap and just want their paycheck that that's what i believe okay that's because that that just it, it it it's annoying when you see these guys that they'll be replying to Meltzer on twitter they'll have them on their mm-hmm. podcast like stop legitimizing this he's no different than me i'm just some schmuck who talks about this shit it, exactly bro it's ridiculous bro it's ridiculous i'll never understand it all right so switching on from wrestling entirely now you're a big baseball fan. I'm a big baseball fan. I'm a yeah, lifelong Yankees fan. Are you kidding? Me? <laughs> that was preposterous. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> that is pre- the, I'll never understand the preposterous thing either. But what are your thoughts on all of the rule changes that have taken place within baseball? Oh man, bro. Um, I don't have a problem with the DH because there were a lot of free agents this year that would have been signed if there was a DH in the National League. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a problem with with that, bro. If it means more people having jobs, I think they should go ahead with the DH. Bro, to me, the the seven inning double headers, the the guy starting on second base in the tenth inning, bro, that's the equivalent of AEW's style of wrestling. Like, yeah. that's not freaking baseball. Now they're experimenting with, uh, in, uh, you know, minor league ball, moving the pitcher's mound back. Yeah, 61 so, feet, six inches. Bro, bro, th- think about that. Guys have worked years and years and years of developing a curveball and a slider and, you know, uh, you know, a split finger. Bro, now you're going to move the mound back and they've got to rework those pitches because of the break of the – like, it's it's ridiculous, bro. I understand they want to speed the game up. I think there are ways of speeding the game up without affecting the game that much. Well, I think one of the ways – the problem that they always say, it's not the speed, it's the pace. And one of the reasons the pace is as bad as it is is because of all the – are you familiar with all the, the goofy analytics that all these teams are employing yeah. where it's it's not about, you know, moving runners, getting on base, solid contact. It's just about either walking, striking out, or hitting home runs. Yeah. If the, No matter how many rule changes you employ, if that's the methodology that they're teaching the hitters to go up at the plate with, of course the pace is going to be boring because it's just a bunch of guys striking out. Yeah, I agree, bro. I agree. Who are you a fan of? I'm a big Yankees. Well, I – it's kind of hard to watch this year, but I'm a Yankees guy. Yeah, they're uh, God, they're struggling this year, bro. Well, it's it's good. Like I said, they've had the same methodology since since they got Aaron Boone as the manager. Where don't move runners, don't make contact, don't like string together hits. Just everybody swing for the fences. Yeah, yeah. And uh, eventually, like you know, of course you'll you'll string together a couple of weeks where you're all hitting home runs, but you're, you're good, also going to go through the long stretches where there's just nothing. Right, right. And, and you're never going to win in the playoffs. With that. I know you're a big San Francisco Giants fan. When you won the three World Series in the five years, those were scrappy teams. They reminded me of the Yankees teams I grew up with in the yeah. in the late 90s, where it was just a bunch of guys, you know, passing the baton. It wasn't like one guy's going to come up and hit 17 million home runs. Yep, yep. Yeah, those were some of the most fun teams the, to watch. The Giants never won a World Series with Bonds, bro. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God, those Giants teams are fun to watch. The Giants became like my second fate. Like if the Yankees are out, I would always root for the Giants just because those teams are so much fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're, we're very near the end here, Mr. Roos. I didn't want to keep you too long. And I, I know talking about wrestling is not something that you enjoy too much. I was asked to ask you because you're a bison. Do mm-hmm. uh, fa- you have any particular favorite Italian dishes? Oh, man, I love all Italian food, bro. I get asked this a lot, but... um. 
God, it's I, I I'm 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 a big fan of Italian food, bro. I love it all. So I, I really can't give you one, but I love it all. Right. Okay. Listen, you got to get your plugs out there for the brand, your Patreon, everything. Yeah, get it all out there because it's all I, worth I it. Have, well, I have two platforms, guys, and we have different shows on each platforms with different wrestling personalities on different platforms. I've got russosbrand.com that's one and the other one is patreon.com forward slash russo twc bro it starts at like 75 cents a week there's no long-term commitment but i mean bro if you want to hear from people who have been there and done that that's what the brand is everybody was involved in the business at one time or another you know i say it all the time bro russo's brand where the pros are pros if you really want to know how this thing works then you want to listen to people that have been there and done that and again guys if you like our channel you will love the content that mr russo offers on there again i watch castrating the marks every day at work it's hilarious. It, it's not just a bunch of guys talking wrestling and boring the shit. It's funny. It's entertaining. Mr. Russo himself has a lot of other great shows that he does. Your show at Disco is like must watch every week. I know it's probably a yeah. chore for you to try to get it a is, word in edgewise. Well, if, you, if you see the Disco puppet's gone because every time I do the show with him, I got to move the puppet and then bring <laughs> the puppet in when the show's with him or Rosa. I just got done with Disco. That's why there's no mm -hmm. puppet. Right. Yeah, no, I've I've been a, a brand member. I mean, it's rolled over for two months now, and I have no plans of ending it because I, I, I need it at work. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot, man. And uh, give the plug also. You do a, a raw review every week with uh, on Sports Keto Wrestling. Yeah, I do a raw review every week with a uh, Dr. Chris on Sports Keto. And also, guys, if you're on Twitch, I'm on there all the time, rapping with the brand all the time. Just go to Twitch.tv forward slash vince russo live i'm always on twitch all right cool mr russo i can't express to you how much i appreciate you appearing on our goofy channel here uh before we end i just want to reiterate again don't listen to what the asshole say out there you know that for what you did you were the best ever to do it in history well, bro, i will tell you this i i i will say this um uh, and I have no problem saying this, bro, to this day, nobody has ever outworked me. And I think that bothers them more than anything else because, bro, you got a lot of politics in wrestling. You got a lot of people that like to take shortcuts. When you have somebody that busts their ass that you can't outwork, then you're going to try to do everything to, to, to take that person down. Bro, nobody outworked me. Uh, when I was writing television, you know, me and Ed and uh, nobody will out, nobody will outwork me in podcasting. You're just not going to yes. outwork me. I don't I don't take the political route, bro. I am going to outwork you. But I wanted to thank you to righty uh, all your support, bro. You guys doing the shows and putting me over. It really, really means a lot to me, man. So thanks a lot. I really, really appreciate it. Cool, man. Yeah. Keep in touch. It was a thrill having you on here. Do it again sometime, maybe. Yeah, anytime, bro. Just let just let me know. We'll do it again. Cool, man. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the brand. Support them on Patreon. I promise you the content is worth it. He's got a lot of great ex-wrestlers on there. Can you give some of the names of the people you have on there? Oh, God, bro. I always forget, but I got the Disco Inferno. I got Stevie Richards. I got Stevie Ray of Harlem Heat. I've got Shane Douglas. I've got... Uh, just incredible. I, I see. I always forget, bro. I got a uh, hold on. Vito. Who, v, I got big Vito. I got uh, I got Dutch Mantel. I got Kevin Sullivan. Uh, gosh, bro, people. Always, Taylor Hendricks, the beautiful people, Goldilocks. There are at least 15 people on there that you will know that all worked actively in the business, man. Check it out, guys. You will not be disappointed. And the great Jeff Lane. You can't forget Jeff. The great, the great Lois Lane, yes. He's, <laughs> he's a part of it as well, yeah. So anyway, if you like us, if you like wrestling, you'll enjoy the brand. Please, please support Mr. Russo. The content is well worth it. And it's it's very cheap. If, you don't, if you're not a brand member, then you're just cheap at that point. So again, <laughs> Vince, thank you so much for making the appearance. I really appreciate it. Uh, 
what can I say? You're, you're yeah. the greatest ever at what you did. Well, right, righty. Thank you. And like I said, man, I appreciate all your support, man. Thanks a lot, bro. Cool, man. All right, everybody. Take care, children. We'll see you some other time or whatever. Yeah. <laughs>